Hi guys, welcome to Keep Calm and Nelson YouTube channel. So remember that, remember to subscribe, like, and share. So guys, welcome to today's presentation. Uh, so today we are going to discuss about ascariasis. Now, take note that we are done with the diarrhea diseases. Now we are moving on to tropical medicine. We are moving on to tropical medicine, and that's why today we are discussing about ascariasis. So, guys, the general objective of this discussion is that at the end of this discussion, you should be able to acquire knowledge on ascariasis and be able to meet a patient with ascariasis. Our specific objective as follows, you should be able to describe the morphology and the epidemiology of uh, ascariasis. You should be able to state the cause and transmission of ascariasis, how, what, is, what causes it and how it is transmitted. Then you should be able to describe the life cycle of the ascariasis parasite. Then you should be the parasite or the worm itself then you should be able to state the signs and symptoms then you should be able to describe the medical management you should be able to state the complication and the preventive measures of ascariasis now when it comes to our introduction ascariasis is a human disease caused by a parasitic roundworm called ascaris rumbicus so about a quarter of the world's population are infected. It is particularly prevalent in the tropical regions and in the areas of poor hygiene. The nascariasis is also called a round worm. So from the introduction, we can also say we can define ascariasis as a parasitic infection which is caused by ascariasis lumbricoid which is transmitted through the ingestion of food or soil which is contaminated with uh, the ascaris over and it is characterizing characterized by ingestion by sorry vomiting of a worm and abdominal discomfort so I did include the definition, but from what I've said, you should be able to come up with a definition. So I'll go through that again. I said ascariasis is a condition or it is a parasitic disease caused by a parasite, a parasitic roundworm called ascaris rumbricoid. So it is transmitted through the ingestion of contaminated soil or poor, poorly washed vegetables and it is characterized by vomiting of a worm or passing a worm in stool and the abdominal discomfort. So that's how you can define it. So we have looked at the introduction already. So when it comes to the morphology, this is how the parasites look like. This one is the female one and the male one. You should be able to notice that the females are bigger than the males. So Ascaris lumbricus is the largest intestinal nematoid of human. The females are larger than the males and can measure up to 40 centimeters in length and 6 millimeters in diameter. So they are white in color or can be pink and are tapered at both sides. So as you can see, there is, that, there is this shape at the end side of it. Then they are white or can be pink. Then when, they, when it comes to the ova or the web, the, the egg, the ova are oval and has a thick shell, a malinated outer coat will be able we will see how the over look like as we move on 
So when it comes to the epidemiology, so the epidemiological factors of as characters as follows. Roughly about 1.5 billion people are infected with the roundworm and primarily in Africa and Asia. So it's one of the most common parasitic worms or worms, parasitic diseases or other worms. So it's one of the most common uh, parasitic diseases, as we can see from the numbers. The Nascarasis is endemic in the United States. So even in the United States, there are these worms, though, including the Gulf Coast, Nigeria, and Southeast Asia. So that's about the epidemiology. So let's look at the cause and the transmission. As we've discussed earlier, we have said it is caused by a scarlet lung cause. So transmission is through, it's by, it is transmitted to humans by ingestion of soil contaminated with human feces that harbors a scarce lumbricot lava. So when someone ingests soil or poorly washed vegetables which harbors, which harbors the, the ova, so this is how the ova looks like. So we said, uh, during the morphology, we said if the ova are... Um, they are oval and have a thick shell and lunated coat. So this is what we are able to see. It's oval in shape and it has this coat. So this is how the egg looks like. And they're saying this one is unfertilized egg. Yeah. So this is how the ova looks like. Make sure you understand how it looks like because this is what is ingested. It undergoes some development, then it's what is ingested so that the life cycle continues. So we have said transmission is through the ingestion of food. So we are saying that um, transmission, transmission occurs, uh, it may be direct or indirect so ingestion may occur directly or indirectly by eating contaminated soil or indirectly by eating poorly washed raw vegetables grown in contaminated soil so that's about the transmission so remember there's the issue of eating soil so this soil may be contaminated with human feces which others the over then also poorly washed vegetables which are grown in the soils which are contaminated with ascariasis ovas or eggs now let's move on to look at it the life cycle of the ascaris lumbricoids so as we can see from this picture in stage one stage one we have these adult worms which are living in the small intestines here so these adult worms these adult worms will um, meet and produce the eggs now the eggs are the ones which are going to be passed on in the feces or in the stool so these eggs are in the feces this is still the first stage these are eggs which are found in the soil so they all can be direct in the soil or uh, on the vegetables which are grown in contaminated water so now these eggs will undergo development so at first the egg what is inside this egg will be an fertilized egg so this is what will go will undergo further development it will become fertilized inside this shell the cortex then it will develop into the effective stage of a lava so this is the lava which is able to which is visible under the microscope so in the first stage first stage the eggs then the egg uh, undergoes further development there is formation of uh, an effective larva which is uh, which is 
visible under the microscope. So these same things which are inside, they are undergoing further development at stage two. They undergo further development to produce an embryonated egg. So this is a larva now, which so all this development is taking place inside the egg or inside the ova. So during uh, the third stage, this ova now is the one which is going to be ingested in the mouth. So when this is ingested, so this Ova, or this ova can be found in the soil, as we said earlier, or on the poorly washed vegetables. So when it is ingested, it will go, as someone is swallowing it, it goes in the GIT through the stomach, then it will go in the small intestine. So now in the small intestine, that's the stage 5, that's under stage 5, it will break. So the egg will arch a larva and it will enter the circulatory system and migrate to the lungs. So when this larva, when it arches in the small intestine, it will penetrate through uh, these tissues, the walls of the intestines, to the circulatory system and finally it will go to the lungs through the circulatory system, that's it, in stage three. So when it comes to the lungs, it will undergo further development after about 10 days or so, it will be in the lungs. Then this larva will start migrating up the respiratory system. So it was in the alveoli, so it starts now climbing up the respiratory tree, the bronchial tree, so from the alveoli to the bronchi, to the bronchioles, to the trachea, then on the epiglottis. So a person will feel like coughing, they'll feel like there's something on the epiglottis. And this they are going to swallow, not knowing that, that what they are swallowing is the larva or the worm. So when, when they are swallowed on the epiglottis, that's at stage 7, the larva are coughed up and swallowed, re entering the gastrointestinal tract. Maturing, maturation proceeds in the small intestine. So, when they are swallowed in the GIT, they'll come down the stomach, then go to the small intestine, where now they are going to mature, become um, adult worms. The males and the females will start meeting together, and then they will start producing eggs. And these eggs are the ones which are going to be found in the feces and it is in the circle stat. So that's it, the life cycle of the um, Ascaris rumbricos worm. So notice that as they are in the small intestines, there will be, you know, what happens in the small intestines is the absorption of the nutrients. So it means that. These worms are going to be feeding on the nutrients that th this person has eaten. So instead of those nutrients being utilized by the body, these worms will now start feeding on those uh, nutrition, nutritious foods. As a result, this person may become malnourished or if they are children, they will be under development due to the lack of food. Uh, food, adequate food or adequate nutrition, which is being taken up by these worms, which are in their small intestines. So let's move on. Let's just go through again the life cycle. So we said that the ascariasis is never passed on direct from one person to another. It is not infectious. So it occurs when a person has ingested the ascariasis lumbricus ova which hatch and release a, or a larva, which now penetrates the intestinal wall and reaches the lung through the bloodstream. I'm sure you're able to remember this. We just looked at it when we are looking at the, the drawing, the picture. So after about 10 days in the pulmonary capillary and the alveoli, the larva migrates to the bronchial, the bronchial, 
the bronchi, the trachea, and the epiglottis. And from there, we said they are swallowed up by this person and they return to the GIT system and into the small intestines where they mature and become adult worms, which start now to produce the eggs, which are now uh, going to be passed on in the feces and they will be found in the soils or on the vegetables which are grown in the soils which are contaminated. So that's the life cycle of the Ascaris lumbricose worms. Now let's now look at this, the signs and symptoms that this person is going to have. So this patient will complain about see, that stomach discomfort. So there will be uh, abdominal discomfort because of the presence of these worms in the GIT and specifically in the small intestines. So because they are now mature, these worms are the ones um, which are vomited. So ascariasis actually is one of the parasitic infections where one vomits a worm or passes the worms in the stool. So if your child or maybe yourself or maybe a patient at the clinic or hospital presents with the history of vomiting a worm or maybe they are even vomiting in your presence, you just know that it is the Ascaris lumbricos. So there will be also restlessness. Restlessness will be due to the presence of the infection in the body. Then there will also be signs of intestinal obstruction. So signs of intestinal obstruction will come about due to the presence of the worms in the intestine. Then there will be weight loss. As I explained earlier during the life cycle, we said these worms are in the small intestines. They are feeding on the nutrients that this patient has just eaten. So instead of the body cells utilizing these uh, nutrients, it is the worms which are now benefiting from the food that this person has taken. As a result, there will be weight loss. Then there will be impaired growth. So if it's in children, we'll see that their growth will be disturbed. They will be static. There may be also signs of poor nutrition. So they may be even malnourished. It is because the nutrients that these children are taking are being taken up by the worms. So that's why school children are, should be always be dewormed. Yes. So there will also be fever, so fever due to the presence of the parasite in the body. Then there will be abdominal distension which will come about due to the signs of intestinal obstruction which this child or this patient is having. So there will be also disturbed sleep. So because, the, because this, this will come about due to the presence of the parasites in the GIT, the parasites will be moving around the, 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 the intestines. Also, we also saw that when they are just in, ingested, they go in the small intestines. They penetrate through the walls of the intestines to the, res, to the circulatory system. Then they go to the lungs. So all that process will cause a disturbance in one's System. Then there is also the issue of coughing up. So when the worms, they move up the respiratory system and they reach on the epiglottis, a person will feel irritated. So they will cough up thinking they are coughing just because of maybe an infection, but not knowing that what they are coughing are the worms. So that's uh, what will happen when one has got a sclerosis. There is also some kind of cough. Then there is also disturbance sleep from what we have uh, said already. Now we said earlier on that uh, during the signs and symptoms, there may be signs of intestinal obstruction. So this is what will happen. This is what may happen. So these worms have matured 
and they, they have blocked the intestines. This is what we are able to see. And this is a severe complication, which means that this child or this patient has to undergo an operation for these worms to be removed. So now, how can we diagnose ascariasis? So the diagnosis is usually evidenced by a patient passing a worm in the stool or vomiting a worm. Then also stool samples can be examined and the presence of the ovum and the parasite will be in the, in the stool. So stool sample can be collected for examination and the ova and the parasite can be found in the stool. Then the larva may be found in the gastric or respiratory secretions in the pulmonary system. You remember during the life cycle where the, these parasites, they go into the, the respiratory system, they go into the lungs. So they can be found when someone spits, uh, coughs up, they can be found in the in the circulations or during a gastric lavage maybe uh, some parasites these worms can be aspirated out of the GIT. so a full blood count can also be done which may show peripheral insinophilia then also an x-ray can be done which can show the presence of uh, some of um, the worms so they can be uh, found on the x-ray and they are saying uh, they can measure 15 to 30 centimeters long filling defects. So they can also be evident on the x-ray. So that's how we can diagnose the ascariasis. So now let's move on to the treatment. So the drugs that are uh, used to kill uh, these worms are called ascaricides. So these are drugs which are used to kill these worms and one of them is the nebendazole which is also called vemox so this is what we are all we are also using currently if you are in zambia i know be in north africa yeah so this is the drug which is very common that we are using so what it does is it it causes slow immobilization and death of the worm by selectively and irreversibly breaking the up, blocking the uptake of glucose. As a result, these worms are going to die. So we can give 100 milligram, uh, 12 hourly orally. So one tablet twice a day for three days, or we can give 500 milligrams as a start dose, and that is what we are doing exactly ah uh, yes then we also have papillazine with this a uh, mode of action for the sake of time you should be able to go through it then the doses are 75 milligram per kg body weight with a maximum dose of 3.5 gram as a single dose then planquatal permanent also can be given with that mode of action then the dose should not exceed uh, 11 milligram per kg body weight and should be given as a single dose then our benders will also can be given and we are also giving our benders so it can be given as a single dose at 400 milligram or it can also be given 100 milligram BD, which is 12 hourly for three days. So we are also using this one. So make sure that your children are dewormed every after is it six six months. So make sure that your children receive the benders or Vemox to prevent them from having worms. In so, and, uh, so we want to prevent that. So when it comes to the nursing management, um, depending on the severity of how, or how severe the child or the patient is, we are going to uh, nurse them according to how they are uh, presenting. So when it comes to the nursing care plan, these are some of the problems which the child or the patient may present with. 
So there is altered growth and development, altered nutrition, less than body requirements, colonic constipation, then infective breathing patterns, you know, due to the presence of the worms in their lungs, then hypothermia, which is fever, which is due to the presence of their parasites in the body, then also knowledge deficit due to lack of exposure to these worms by the parents or the patients themselves. So if we are going to have time, we are going to look at part B of this presentation where we look at the nursing care plan, how we can put these problems on the nursing care plan and how we can um, nurse this patient. So when it comes to the complications, complications as follows, intestinal obstruction, as we saw, be, due to the uh, presence of presence and multiplication of these parasites in the intestines, if there are lots, they can cause obstruction. Then also appendicitis, the inflammation of the appendix, then there is also the ascarasis. This is where now the, the, the parasites can also go into the gallbladder and can just cause infection there. Then perforation of the intestines due to these intestines feeding in the, um, being formed in the small intestines and also perforating the intestines. Then cholecystitis, cholecystitis also can come about, then also peritonitis and pancreatitis. Pancreatitis can also come in. So these are some of the complications which can come about due to um, ascariasis. So now let's move on to look at the prevention measures. So how can we prevent ascariasis? Remember that we said transmission occurs when one ingests contaminated soil or poorly washed vegetables which ha harbor the ascariasis over. So we want to make sure that we prevent fecal contamination of soil is required. So make sure if the area uh, we, we prevent um, the especially also the defecation of um, outside the toilet. So we want to make sure that when someone children open bowels they shouldn't open bowels in the surroundings because they may have the, um, the parasites. And if they defecate on the surrounding, it means the soil is going to be infected. So we want to make sure that we educate the community that whenever children open bowels on the surrounding, make sure that immediately the stool is put in the toilet. And also soil treatment can be done for areas where uh, there is evident of uh, contamination of soil by these parasites. Then also massive treatment with single dose of albendazo or mebendazo for all school going children every three to four months has been used in some communities. Yes, so this is what we are saying that the deworming should be done yeah? every three to four months so it's not five months or, or six months it's three months to four months and guys that's where we end our presentation for today these were my references and please make sure that you like this presentation you like you share write in your comments any questions that you can have make sure that you are free to to put on the comment section and i'll be able i'll be glad to answer your questions thank you so much for listening and have a pleasant